for the moms who raised us up, gave us hope, and made us strong. For the young moms who became moms sooner than expected and gave it all they had. For the single moms who had to figure out how to do this on their own. For those who never got called mom, but who cared for us all like a mom would. For the hurting moms who've loved and lost but never given up. For the praying moms who don't always know what to do, but always know who to talk to. For the working moms, the stay home moms, the cooking moms, and the takeout moms. For taking care of us when you barely had enough time to take care of yourself. For teaching us how to walk and how to make a difference. For the late night snuggles and the early morning pancakes. For sitting with us after our first breakup. For lifting us up when others put us down. For the rides, the meals, the laundry, and the birthday parties. For the years, tears, laughter, and love. It's not enough, but we want to say thank you. Thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. We remember you. We thank you. You see, we're so glad that you've taken time out of your morning to be a part of our service, and, and t especially on today, on Mother's Day. So we wanted to start by just saying that we appreciate you mothers for everything that you've done for us and all you continue to do for us, and we hope that today you'll have a wonderful day with your family. Before we start our service, there's some announcements I'd like to share with you. The first is if you're having a hard time staying connected, it can be really hard during this time of isolation to be connected with others. And there's several ways that you can do that. You could fill out our Connect card on our Facebook, on our website, and that would get to us. You can join our Facebook group. You could be a part of our Zoom prayer meeting. That'll be on Wednesday at 630 as well, our life groups are just finishing up the current study, and we'll be starting a new one. And so in the next couple of weeks, if, it's a great time to join a, a life group if you're not part of one. As well, over the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear some information about a marriage seminar we're going to be offering. It'll all be online. It'll be four Friday nights uh, starting May 22nd. So just mark that off in your calendar. You and your spouse will be blessed by Mark Gunger, who is a comedian and a pastor who will share via online for us during that time. Many of you have uh, dropped by the office this week in order to give. We've seen your giving in the, in the offering slots through the door, and we continue to continue to do that. We encourage you to continue to do that as we seek to bless those around us. Some of you have been asking what other ways there are other than giving that you can encourage those in our community. And we do have a, a unique opportunity that's been presented to us to handwrite cards of encouragement for the residents of the Golden Plow, the seniors' home in our area. And so if you're willing to do that, we encourage you to talk to Lois Milson. And we need those cards to be dropped off here by Wednesday, May 20th. And we want to make sure that every resident in the home gets one. And now we just have a, an announcement from Pastor Ben. Hey, FBC Church, Pastor Ben here, and I'm so excited to be back in ministry with FBC, back from my sabbatical, and the sabbatical was different than I thought it would be, but the last three months for all of us have been very different, haven't they? Well, this week, as I was really excited to get back into ministry, it was also a really, really tough week, as on Tuesday we heard about the passing of Christy, and we grieve and cry and mourn together. Uh, Naomi and I cried together over it and we want to continue to remember Christie's family as they grieve this loss and how hard it will be for them and so please continue to pray for them I know lots of you have been pray that God would shine his light into this dark situation and continue to pray for the Russells uh, as they continue to come alongside the Patel family and as they grieve the loss as well of their friend Christie. We're going to take some time now to pray for Christy and her family, and we're going to be praying for our missionaries and for our frontline workers, and so would you pray with me right now? Father, our hearts are grieving, our hearts were broken this week when we heard about the news about Christy, and Lord, we are confused and and we're sad and we're angry and it's so tough and lord I, 
can't imagine what Christie's family is going through at this time. And so, Father, we pray that you would comfort them, that you would be their portion. Father, I pray that you would shine your light into this dark situation. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom as to how we can best come alongside and encourage and comfort them uh, in, a, in a situation like we have in our world today where we can't give hugs. We can't come inside their house to comfort them. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom on how we can best do that. Father, we also pray for the Russells, and we thank you for this family who has come alongside them and walked this journey with them so well. And I pray that you would comfort them in the midst of this. And Lord, pray that you would give them comfort in order that they may comfort Christie's family. Father, we know that life is, is different for many people right around our world, for basically the entire world. And we pray for our missionaries today. And we pray as they adjust to what the new norm is for them in ministry that you would be able to uh, encourage them and they would see great fruit out of their ministry during a, a time where there's social distancing. Father, it was even exciting to talk with uh, Chris Ball this week and to hear what is going on with them in South Sudan. And I pray that you would continue to bless them as Chris is able to have some more flights open back up uh, to minister to those who are in such great need. Father, we also pray and thank you for our front care, uh, frontline care workers. Uh, Lord, those who work in the medical field, those who work in our long-term care homes, those who work in group homes, uh, those who have to go to work uh, to care for others. And we pray that you would bless them, keep them safe, uh, keep all of those facilities safe from uh, COVID-19. And Father, we uh, uh, thank you that in the midst of all of this, you are enough for us, that you are enough, even when things are are disappearing in our lives when things are not normal that we know that we can come to you and that you are enough for us and father now as we worship you uh in our different homes uh lord it's so great to know that we all have the same spirit dwelling in us we are all worshiping the same god we are all saved through our save sa same savior jesus christ and so may we worship with that unity in mind and i pray this all in jesus name amen is rising eyes are turning to you we turn to you Yeah. 
sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities for as high as the heavens are above the earth so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us praise the lord all his heavenly hosts you his servants who do his will praise the lord all his works everywhere in his dominion praise the lord my soul Riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead. See you. 
with me before we open God's Word? Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can sing those songs of praise to you because you are worthy of our praise. And Lord, as we sit in our homes, as we seek to open your word and hear from you, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? May we know that we've heard from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, there was a church in Dallas that became splintered. In fact, so bitter was the division that they decided they couldn't stay together, they had to part, and yet they couldn't decide on who would get the building, so they sued each other. In court, the the judge, he wisely ruled that it was something that should be heard by the nomination first, so the dispute was remanded to the ecclesiastical court where a decision was eventually made in favor of one group. They got the building, the other group, they went down the street and started their own church. One Dallas newspaper, though, reported that the church court had traced the problem, the trouble, back to its source. That the trouble, it began at a church dinner when an elder received a smaller slice of ham than the child sitting next to him. You can imagine the people who read that newspaper in Dallas, how much laughter they got out of that. Of course, that's nothing new. Leslie Flynn and in the, in the book entitled Great Church Fights, quotes a story from a Welsh church, a Welsh newspaper who writes about a church that was looking for a new pastor. It reads this, Yesterday, the two opposition groups both sent ministers to the pulpit. Both spoke simultaneously, each trying to shout above the other. Both called for hymns from the congregation, and each side tried to drown the other out. Then the groups began shouting at each, other, at each other. Bibles were raised in anger. The Sunday morning service turned into a bedlam. Through it all, the, the two preachers continued to outshout each other with their sermons. Eventually, a deacon called the, called the police. Two police came in and began shouting for the congregation to be quiet. They advised the 40 persons in the church to return home. The rivals filed out, still arguing, the article reads. I'm sure those who got that paper, they got a good laugh out of that as well. But as funny as that is, sadly, those are both true accounts. In fact, I would hazard guess that if you've been around any church or a part of any church for any length of time, you've probably been a part of a church that has either gone through this sort of thing or have heard of churches that have. Churches that have split over things like the color of the carpet or, or how to use the facility or, or voiced opinions about the style of music that should be used that led to heated debates, all of them causing rifts and divisions, and in the process, dividing the church itself. Now, if you hadn't guessed, today we come to a passage that was written to just that kind of church, a church that was being divided. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me back to the book of Philippians, this time chapter 1. I'm going to cover the end of that chapter. As you turn, you'll remember that two weeks ago we started into this book, a book that was written by the Apostle Paul as a thank you letter for the gift that those in Philippi, the Philippians, had sent Paul. The Philippian church, it was a church that Paul had planted some four years before, and yet he had been forced to leave it. Somehow his, his absence had only caused their love for each other to grow stronger. To the point that for Paul, the the Philippians, they were more than just another group of believers. They were his partners in the gospel, sharing the same task as him, about the same mission, intent on the same goal, hoping to see the kingdom of God advance, the gospel go forward. Together they were a band of brothers and sisters on mission to save the souls of the world. In fact, so connected was he with them that Paul would write, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, as we started into this book a, a few weeks ago, we discovered that Paul, like most of our missionaries today, had started his letter by giving them a report on how the gospel was doing, how it was advancing, how, how despite his imprisonment, despite the opposition he had faced, the, the gospel was being preached all through Rome. Paul, no doubt, wanting that to be true in Philippi as well. Well, having finished his report... Paul, he he moves on to discuss other things in the section we want to look at today. If you would, follow along as I read. I'll start reading in verse 27 of chapter 1. Paul writes this, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. 
This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggles you saw I had and now hear that I still have. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Here, Paul, he starts out the section we read by telling us that we ought to live a certain way. Truly, there was hardly a more central thought, a more central call for Paul than what he starts with. In the NIV it read, whatever happens, the Greek, it literally reads only. In other words, Paul is saying just this one thing. It was like a pastor saying, if you only remember this one thing and forget the rest, you'll get what I'm saying. Carl Barth once said that it reads like a lifted warning finger. Paul, he wanted to be clear that if they ever needed to pay attention, it was to this, that first and foremost, whatever happened, they needed to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. In fact, so overarching was this for Paul that he referred to it often. Not sure? Consider 1 Thessalonians 2 where you read, you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Or turn over to Colossians where he says to those in Colossae, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Or turn over to Ephesians where Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Strange, isn't it, when you stop and think about it? I mean, each one of these, each one of these groups that Paul was writing to, they had already trusted Jesus just as the Philippians had. And, and, and yet, he was, you mentioned the word gospel in each one of those. Why would Paul, of all things, make the gospel central when he was speaking to believers? You know, today when we tend to think of the gospel, we think of the good news that Jesus came, that he died and he rose again, and a message that those who don't believe need to hear simply because without it, they're destined to hell. They can't stand before God. It's a message they desperately need. And so when we hear it, we just assume that that message is really for them. And once we've received Jesus, once we've received that forgiveness, we no longer need it. We no longer need the gospel other than to share it with those who haven't heard it yet. But while we tend to think that way, Paul certainly didn't. Now instead, over in Romans chapter 1, we even follow Paul, find Paul writing to the believers in Rome, telling them that he longed to come to them to preach the gospel to them. It's a passing comment, one that you probably would skim over if you're reading the book without noticing. But why would Paul want to preach the gospel to believers? Why would he refer to the gospel here to the Philippians? If it, all it was good for was coming to faith. They all already had come to faith. No, well, I believe it was because Paul didn't see it that way. No, instead he knew that the gospel, it wasn't just the, the answer to the penalty of sin, making it impossible for us to be right with God and go to heaven, as important as that is, but that it was also the answer to the power of sin now in our lives. After all, if you've received Jesus, if you've come to know him, Jesus has changed everything for you. I mean, think about it. If you're saved today, the Bible says that you were redeemed, that you're no longer a slave to sin, but can now live righteously, that you have been regenerated, that you've been given spiritual life, that while you were orphans, God adopted you into his family, and while you were guilty of sin, that through Jesus you have been forgiven. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Well, all of that and more, it doesn't just save us, but it should affect how we live. In other words, if you've come to faith in Jesus, the gospel has changed who you are. It's changed who you're following. It's altered your, your goals and your values, it's, and it's given you a standing before God. And, and while that should change you, it should shape you. It should change what you say and do. And that is exactly what Paul is getting at here. He wants us to live up to who the gospel has made us to be. 
In fact, Paul, he uses the idea of citizenship to get it across. That is, after all, the word for conduct yourself, and that phrase, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel, really means. Probably a better translation would be, live as citizens in a manner worthy of the gospel. See, it was just that Paul, he, he knew that the idea of citizenship was an idea that the Philippians would connect with, that they would understand. And after all, like, unlike many of the cities around them, most of the cities around them, they were a colony, and as such, that made them different. It made them more important simply because as a colony, their citizens were citizens of Rome itself on par with someone who lived there. They prided themselves in it. It gave them privileges others didn't have. It set them apart. It made them respected. You might have had a similar experience. I remember years ago being in downtown Athens in a store. The, the owner was speaking English to those who I was with, and they were trying to sell us a, a leather jacket that had a, a, an emblem of it, on it of the Canadian Mounted Police. I was surprised by how good their English was. In fact, I was kind of enjoying the, the bantering back and forth when all of a sudden an American walked in. And the, and the clerk we were talking to instantly acted like they didn't understand any English. That is until the American laughed and she turned and started speaking English with us again. And it's not just there. No, I remember another time being pulled aside on the border of Zambia and being told that the 18 Canadians I was with would be allowed to enter, but not the American. They couldn't come in. You probably have your own stories. Well, so it's quite possible that you have a pride in your citizenship and being Canadian. That just as the Philippians were proud of their citizenship, you are proud of yours. And yet, while that gives you a glimmer of what citizenship would have meant for them, you need to know that that is only half of the picture. You see, back in Paul's day, being a citizen was far more than just being from a certain country or a certain city-state. No, instead, it was to be involved in fact, it would be impossible, almost impossible, for a person to be a citizen of a city without being a part of its public life. It, the city, it was their life. They, they knew about it. They prided themselves in its customs and festivals. They even gave their loyalty to it. It was seen as the best part of their life. Well, since that's the case for the Philippians, Paul, Paul, he draws on that. And as he does so, he doesn't tell them to live as good citizens of Rome and Philippi, but instead to live as citizens in a manner worthy of the gospel, as citizens of the kingdom, really. No doubt Paul thought that just as Philippi, since their language and their architecture, even their dress, was modeled after Rome, reminding people of Rome that when someone visited them, you thought of Rome, that just like that, when someone would visit the church or spend time with believers, our way of life and our language and our conduct should remind them that we are citizens of Jesus' kingdom. Over in chapter 3, Paul would write, for our citizenship is in heaven. In Colossians, he writes that he, God, has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the sunny loves. In other words, just as Philippi was part of Rome, a little Rome, a church should be an outpost of the kingdom, and its citizens should reflect that. I don't know about you, but as a parent, time and time again, I find myself saying something like this to my kids, that telling them that that, isn't just, that just isn't how someone from our family behaves. It isn't how a Houghton behaves. It's my way of saying to them that I have a standard. No, it's not that they need to keep that standard in order to be a Houghton. It, it isn't that if they do, don't, that they're disowned. They don't obey to be Houghtons, but they are Houghtons. I'm just calling them to act like it. Well, the same way since God has saved us, since he has started his work in us and made us citizens, since he's adopted us as his own, we are, are to start to act like it to act in a way that's consistent with the gospel. In fact, so much so that Paul is going to take most of the rest of the book of Philippians to tell us how to do so. And in the passage we read, he starts off by doing that, by giving us one of the most important ways, that of unity. So notice first, we're to live worthy of the gospel by standing firm against opposition, that we are to stand firm together. Today, when you think of Christians, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Maybe it's someone in a choir, or perhaps it's someone sitting in a library like a monk. But not Paul. No, Paul, when he thought about believers, he thinks about soldiers and determined athletes. At least those are the pictures he gives us here. After all, Paul, he starts by taking a word that was used in the military that meant to hold one's ground, to not budge an inch from one's post. In other words, they weren't to run and hide, they were to stand. 
even in the face of attack. Perhaps you've read about the famous Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC, an alliance of Greek states led by the king of the Spartans fought against the mighty Persian Empire, their army. The battle, it took place at the pass of Thermopylae in central Greece. Vastly outnumbered the Greeks, they held their ground against the, the large Persian army for three days in one of the most famous of history's last stands. They did so by blocking the only route, the only road through which the massive Persian army could pass. Well, I'm sure the Philippians must have felt like that small force. They must have felt vastly outnumbered. After all, their, their faith, it had set them apart. True, for some of those in Philippians, they saw the Christians' commitment to Jesus as nothing but a political embarrassment, but most didn't. No, no one said most. They saw it as a threat to their entire way of life. In fact, for the Romans, the Christians' refusal to acknowledge Caesar as Lord, it bordered on treason to the point that they thought of them as atheists because they didn't honor Caesar and tried to pressure them into doing so. Well, Paul knew that that could only lead to one thing. He knew the kind of pressure they would face, the risk that they would face of staying true to the gospel. And so he urged them to stand firm. And Paul, he doesn't tell them to take up arms. He doesn't tell them to launch a campaign or forcibly impose their beliefs on others, but instead to stand their ground for it and to do so together. See, Paul, he knew that it was only as they stood together that they'd be able to withstand the attack. Some of you will remember Tonto and the Lone Ranger. This last week I mentioned them to my kids and they hadn't a clue who I was talking about. So for you younger people, the Lone Ranger was a fictional cowboy and Tonto was his Native American guide and friend. Well, in one of the stories, one day they were riding through a canyon together when all of a sudden the canyon in front of them was filled with Native American warriors on horseback, all dressed for battle. Turning it and looking behind them to their dismay, there too was filled in with warriors. Feeling trapped and not sure how to respond, the Lorraine Ranger turned to Tonto, his Native American guide, and asked, what are we going to do? To which Tonto replied, what do you mean we, white man? Well, that's the exact opposite of what Paul was getting at here. Instead of bailing on each other, they were to stand together. In fact, to drive home his point, Paul, he uses the word contending. It was a term from the world of athletics, a term that would have reminded the people then of the games that became in time the Olympic Games. Some, they, they have suggested it was a word that described wrestling, but not wrestling as you and I would think of it, but rather a competition, a wrestling competition that involved a whole team of wrestlers wrestling together against another team, battling on a united front. The best comparison today might be the offensive line in football, each one blocking side by side, working together. Paul, he wanted them to know that it was only as a team that they could live worthy of the gospel and only as a team that they could advance the gospel. This time of year, I spend more time than I'd like to admit looking at the formation of my favorite NFL team. I, I want to know who they drafted. I want to know who they're going to replace their quarterback with who went to another team. I, I want to know what their strengths are and, and where they need to grow. Well, as I do so, I'm constantly reminded that they are a team and that they will only stand a chance of winning if they play as a team, as each player does their part. Paul here, he draws on that image of a team. He draws on that image from the military to point out how they are to succeed. If they're, it, that is only as they stand firm together that they will be able to do so. That just as in war, you depend on your, your fellow army, those in your army, you depend on your detachment and regiment, just as in sports, you rely on your teammates, that we too need each other. Now, I, I don't know about you, but first, that sounds exciting to me. Working together towards a common cause, shoulder to shoulder, together for the gospel, undeterred by the attack from the world. Truthfully, it should be exciting to us, but sadly, nothing could be further from what we see in the church of North America today. No, instead, of, no, instead of standing firm for the gospel, and instead of acting like a team intent on advancing the gospel, we tend to act like a group of people at a sporting game or a group of people in a mall loosely connected. We're in the same place, but loosely connected, each busy doing their own thing. Or even worse, we try to hide or blend in with the world. As one author wrote, in many places, Christianity has retreated into spiritual ghettos, and believers seem content to have it that way so long as they are safe, and their children never wander beyond the barricades. 
Some Christians publicly wash their hands of all involvement in community, and yet Paul set out with all the enthusiasm he could to claim the world for Christ, even when he was faced with opposition. Well, that is what we are to do as well. Dear Christian, if nothing else, a passage like this should cause us to look in the mirror. It should cause us to ask yourself if we're doing our part or, or whether we're letting other people stand while we hide in the background. Maybe even convincing ourselves that it isn't our job. I mean, don't miss it. Here, Paul, he makes standing not the church leadership's job to do, although they should. It, not just the seniors' job to do, although they need to stand too, but the job of every believer to do together. And not only that, he calls them to do it fearlessly. Fear, it's a powerful thing, isn't it? It tends to ruin our lives and make us step back when we should step forward. It can even cause us to shut down completely. Fortunately, living for our faith can often be a fearful thing. It's certainly easy to understand why those in Philippi would be fearful. After all, the authorities had crucified Jesus, they had outlawed the preaching of the gospel, they'd executed James, they'd imprisoned Peter and Paul, confiscated Christian property, and demanded that the Christians worship Caesar under penalty of death. And things weren't going to get easier for believers for centuries. And over the next several centuries, Christians would be fed to the lions, crucified, dipped in tar, and lit as torches at night, and burned at the stake. Even today, many Christians in the world face imprisonment or death. So there is, there was a reason to be afraid. Now, that isn't the case here. We just don't tend to face that sort of risk in Canada. And yet, despite that, for many, the idea of standing up boldly for their faith still seems to stir up fear. I mean, what if my neighbors hate me for it? What if me standing for my faith, standing for the truth of the Bible, costs me my reputation, or my boss determines to find a reason to let me go over it? Or even worse, what if those closest to me withdrew because of it? I mean, let's face it, Christian convictions are frequently ridiculed in the workplace, in, in academia, and in the news. They're seeming as a constant pressure for us to, to view our faith as unimportant or even backward. And because of that, it's easy to feel isolated, to either feel like we're all alone standing on a tiny island surrounded by a raging sea of opposition, opposition and become depressed about it. I want to feel isolated. Especially if you're all alone. No, no, that's part of the reason why Paul here tells us we are to stand together. Simply because he knew that left alone to stand might be a fearful thing, that it could be overwhelming, that many might fall and feel isolated. And so his hope is that we would do so with each other. Unless you think it isn't necessary, the wording Paul uses here is clear that if there is one thing as believers we should expect, it is opposition. Even that word frightened that Paul uses when he says, I know, or will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened. That, that word there, frightened, it points to it. it. It means to be startled or caught off guard or caused to panic. In other words, opposition is something that you and I, we should expect. Over in the Gospel of John, Jesus, he had told us that a servant is not above his master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you also. It makes sense when you stop and think about it. After all, no one likes to be told they're a sinner, and yet that is the message we carry. Besides, the very symbol for, life, for our life and ministry is a cross. It's not a recliner or a flat screen TV. It, it's a symbol of persecution, not leisure. Well, when, not, not if, but when that happens, when persecution, when opposition comes, Paul tells us we shouldn't be afraid. Someone they once told me that anxiety and fear is the result of being uncertain about achieving a goal we have. So if our goal is to get a job and we're uncertain we'll be able to, we feel anxious about it. If our goal is to be accepted and we stand for something that people don't accept, we're fearful. For, for Paul, that wasn't the case. His one goal was preaching the gospel, so there was no fear. Elsewhere, Jesus told us not to be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And that was true for Paul, so seemingly he had little fear. And while it should be true for us, if most of us are honest, it isn't. No one said we, we may truly want to see the gospel advance, but at the same time, we'd probably all still like to really be liked and 
We want to avoid conflict if we can. And because of that, believers, they tend to shy away from them because they shy away from anything that might cause uncertainty in those areas. And when it comes to sharing the gospel, living the gospel out, there's just a ton of uncertainty. After all, we don't know how people will respond when we share, when we stand for their truth. We, we don't know what they might say, what they might think, or, or what might come of it. Sadly, we somehow forget that what we don't know is outweighed by what we do know. You see, regardless how people respond, we know that God is still in control, that he is still sovereign, and that we are his children, his people, if we've come to him. In fact, in the following verses, that's exactly what Paul goes on to say here, that our suffering, whether severe or slight, whether prolonged or temporary, whether physical or mental, our suffering is a sign that we are his people. But just as it is a sign of destruction to those that oppose us, it's a sign to us who are saved that we are saved. Today, most of us wouldn't think of suffering that way, would we? No, instead, we'd see it as a sign that we aren't loved by God or that God doesn't care or that maybe he cares, but he can't do anything about it to stop it. And yet, nothing could be further from the truth. Instead, here, Paul tells us it's a sign we are saved. It's a sign that God does love us, that he's cared enough about us to save us. It's a sign that we are truly his people, that our future is locked in, unchanging and moving. Our destiny is set. That just as God began a work of salvation in us, he will finish it. That we are citizens of heaven. In fact, so much so that Paul here can refer to suffering as a gift from God. No, no, not in the sense that God is the source of it. He, he isn't the source of it. But in the sense that God in his sovereignty can use suffering for good. Do you remember the, the story of Joseph back in the Old Testament? Back when his brothers sold him into slavery? Well, eventually Joseph, he ends up in Egypt and he rises to power. And there's one day, when the, as the story goes, his brothers come to him. They need his help. And after toying with them a bit, Joseph, he says this to them. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Dear Christian, well, we might not understand it. God intended to use the deeds of those brothers to bring good results. And here Paul says the same thing about suffering. In other words, their suffering for our faith, our suffering, it is not some accident. It's not God's way of punishing us, but really serves as a gift, a gift of assurance, a way to be confident that we are saved. That makes sense. After all, suffering for our faith, it, it tends to divide us into two camps, doesn't it? Those who stand with God and those who don't. It's just that those who aren't really committed, that... They don't tend to stick around when persecution comes. And why would they? I mean, why would you endure a physical discomfort or emotional pain if it wasn't important to you? As one author wrote, in such a crisis, inquirers who have been walking the border between commitment to and rejection of the gospel must finally make a decision. And those who have professed loyalty to the church for ulterior motives finally decide that their deception no longer pays. In other words, suffering is a gift because as we endure it, it proves we are saved. It's evidence that God is at work in us because if he wasn't, we would all walk away. John Calvin once said, Oh, if this conviction were fixed in our minds that persecutions are to be reckoned among God's benefits, what progress would be made in the doctrine of godliness? And yet, what is more certain than that, it is the highest honor of the divine grace that we suffer for his name, either reproach or imprisonment or miseries or torture or even death. For in that case, he decorates us with his insignia. He decorates us with his sign. Dear Christian, you need to know that whether you're facing mocking or insults or, or being ignored or even more severe opposition, or even at some point if you face death, your suffering is not anything but a gift. Seriously, it's a gift that should empower us, it should make us even more bold, simply because if we're confident that we are God's people, then while we might not know what the immediate future holds, we know where the future ends. That while it might look like the church is small and weak and pathetic now, while it might look like the wicked win, we know in the end they don't. We know that God wins, and because we are his children, so do we. So let me ask you, is how you respond to slights for your faith, how you respond to demeaning comments for, comments for your belief, is it a sign that you're saved? Are you standing firm with others in the faith, or are you cowering all alone? 
Now, Paul, having told us that living lives worthy of the gospel means to stand united together against opposition, goes on to tell us that living lives worthy of the gospel also means to be united by putting each, other's for, each other first. It means to be united by putting each other first. Sadly, the Philippians Paul was writing to, they were only facing pressure from outside the Christian community, but they were facing pressure from within inside it. You see, it seems that somehow the that two ladies that had worked side by side with Paul, that were prominent members in the church, Yodia and Syntyche, had, had swerved off course and had turned on each other. In fact, it seems they're disputed. It probably had just started to divide the entire church as church members started to take sides. And so Paul repeatedly urges them in this book to agree and to get back on the same page. In fact, so important was it for Paul that in the section we read, Paul leverages his relationship with them. After all, that's the only command we read in the first four verses of chapter 2 here. Paul telling them to make his joy complete. In essence, Paul says, if for no other reason, then do it for me. Hoping somehow to convince them, to inspire them to do what is right. So that isn't the only motivation that Paul gives them. You know, instead, Paul, he reminds them of all they share in common. That is all those, those four if comments, that's what they are. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness, compassion, each if was a true statement. All of them had that. Every believer has that. These two had that. They both been united with Christ, both been given the gift of faith, both com- comforted by Jesus' love, both given his Spirit, and both shown his compassion. And since that was the case, Paul says they should be united in love and purpose. So instead of having these petty squabbles, Paul wanted them to get their heads on straight and remember their identity, their citizenship, and their common mission together. Sadly, at times we tend to forget that too, don't we? We forget how much we share in common with other believers and instead allow petty things to divide us. We even at times try to tear down those who have a different view than us and disagree with us. And in the process, we waste our time on foolish debates. We get hung up on programming and preferences and minor theological minutiae. And in the process, we turn our attention away from the gospel and living for it to these trivial things. Paul, he knew the result. He knew that rivalry would divide the church, that it would make it ineffective. In his day, Melanchthon, he was a co-worker of Martin Luther. He was so saddened by the divisions he saw among believers that he came up with a parable, hoping that his parable would inspire them to get back together. In it was a parable of the wolves and the dogs, and in it the wolves were somewhat afraid of the dogs. For the dogs were many and strong, and so they sent a spy to observe them. On his return, the, the, the scout said this, It is true the dogs are many, but there are not many mastiffs among them. There are dogs of so many sort, one can hardly count them. And as for the worst of them, they are little dogs, which bark loudly but cannot bite. However, this did not cheer me so much, said the wolf, as this, that as they came marching on, I observed they were all snapping right and left at one another. And I could see clearly that though they all hate the wolf, yet each dog hates each other dog with all his heart. Hundreds of years later, I fear that's still true, that we are so busy snapping right and left at each other, at other believers, when we should be saving our teeth for the wolves. I remember one man in my previous church, he hadn't been particularly fond of some of the decisions I made. He objected once to me coming home for an emergency from a mission strip, and and he objected to one of the interns that we had chosen to hire. Well, at one point, I arranged to have coffee with him at Tim Hortons, and in that town and sitting there he he told me that for the last two years he had come to church every Sunday and listened to my sermon hoping that I would slip up looking for ammo to attack me at first I was curious how much ammo I'd given him fortunately I hadn't given him any yet but then I thought about how sad it was here was a brother in Christ one that I share a lot in common with and yet was so intent on attacking me that he, their focus wasn't on hearing what God was saying on Sunday or reaching others but on trying to get rid of me dear Christian you and I we need to see more than each other's faults we need to see other believers as partners someone Jesus loved enough to die for a fellow family member with the same father on the same mission with the same spirit and with the same savior 
Because when we do, we'll no longer divide over personal issues or minor doctrinal preferences or even because someone is just hard to get along with. But instead, we'll be compelled to do everything we can to stand together, learn together, and contend for the gospel together. In fact, far from just being aware of rivalry, I think Paul would have us hunt rivalry down. He would have us root it out and put it to death. Because if we don't, while we might bring glory to ourselves, we might win the day and gain a following of our own, we might even push the other person out, we certainly won't bring glory to God nor advance the gospel. Note that that is why Paul goes on to tell us we need to be humble by considering others better than ourselves. Why he wanted them to be more concerned with others. If we're honest, there are a few ideas less popular than that today. It just doesn't seem to fly so well in a culture that teaches us what matters is us, that we must look after number one. Well, here, Paul, he tells us that number one, it is way down the list. And not, not just here. Over in Galatians 6, he tells us we're to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And in Romans 10, he tells us to be devoted to one another and brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Paul even lived like that, writing in 1 Corinthians, even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And that is exactly what Jesus did. After all, Jesus gave up the comforts of heaven for this world. He lived among the sin and filth of it and died a shameful death, not for himself, but for us. He put our interests first. So if we're to follow him, if we are to live our lives worthy of the gospel, worthy of our calling, it is simply part of what we must do. So let me ask you, do you seek unity? Does it filter into the way you talk and what you say and what you do? Are you concerned about others, concerned enough to put their interests before your own? Or, or do you waste your energy on foolish debates and things that have nothing to do with advancing the gospel? Dear friends, if there's a Christian sister or brother that you're not speaking to, or someone you're on bad terms with, you need to do something about it. Not just to make my joy complete, although it will, just as it did Paul's, but because God has called you to. It's just part of living a life worthy of the gospel. There's a story of a missionary in the Philippines. And one day he, he set up a croquet game in their front yard. Some of their neighbors, they became interested and they wanted to join. So the missionary explained the rules and got them started out, each with a mallet and a ball. As the game progressed, an opportunity came for one of those players to take advantage of another by knocking their ball off the court. The missionary explained how to do that, and, but his advice had only puzzled his friend. Why would I want to knock his ball off the court, he asked. So you'll be able to win, the missionary said. The short-statured man, clad only in loincloth, shook his head in bewilderment. You see, competition is generally ruled out in a hunting and gathering society where everyone shares everything in common. The game, it continued, but no one followed the missionary's advice. When a player successfully got through all the wickets, the game was not over for him. He simply went back and gave advice and aid to, to those that were still playing. As the final player moved towards the last wicket, the affair was still very much a team effort. And finally, when the last wicket was played, the team shouted, we won, we won. Friends, that is the picture of the church that Paul paints for us here a picture of us set on the same task, doing it together, helping each other advance the gospel and live it out. Well, here in Philippians, just as Paul had conducted himself in a way worthy of the gospel, despite opposition from outside the church and from opposition with inside the Christian community, he wanted the Philippians to do that as well. And so he reminded them and us to, to stand together firm against all opposition and be united by continually putting others first. I don't know where you're at today, but I do know that it is easy for us to get off focus, to stop standing for the truth, to just go along with those around us. It's easy to stop advancing the gospel and just leave it for others to do and not do our part to not contend for it, to not be a part of the team. And yet here, Paul, he calls all of us to do so. He calls us all to do our part, advancing the gospel, living the gospel out on mission together. Sure, that might not seem like a big deal to you. 
But Paul is clear, if you want to live worthy of your calling, worthy of being a citizen of heaven, then it should be because that is just what you need to do. One thing is sure, when opposition does come, you'll wish you had. So perhaps today you need to start doing that. You need to start standing firm. Maybe that means for you that you need to let someone know what you believe that you have not let know. Maybe it means you need to refuse to set aside your morals or defend the truth. Or perhaps you just need to figure out what part you're to play, what part of the line you are to hold, what role of the team on the team God has given you. Whatever it is, you need to do it. Because Paul doesn't present this as an optional add-on, but presents it as an essential part of being a believer, an essential part of being part of the kingdom. So you need to do it. Or maybe you're listening And while you might be able to defend yourself, you defend your faith, you can't do it together simply because you're at odds with another believer. Perhaps there's someone you avoid that when we could meet, you sat on the opposite side of the auditorium to the kind of person who you you see in Walmart and then intentionally jut down another aisle hoping they didn't notice that you're avoiding them simply because you've allowed petty things to come between you. And so Paul would, call, would want you to call them and seek to make it right. To remember what you share in common with them, the very gospel itself. Either way, don't miss it. Paul is calling for you and I to make living worthy of the gospel and advancing it together our central focus and to do so together. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we forgive us when we have allowed petty things to divide us, when we should be focused on advancing the gospel and living it out. We get sidetracked into divisions and, and don't do those things that you've called us to do. Father, help us to be united together with other believers intent on the task that you've given us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. This coming week, I would encourage you to feel free to connect with us. Some of you did last week through the connection cards. Be, please be mindful that this next week is Pastor John. He, is a holiday week for him. He will not be on, on call. So if you call him, you won't get an answer. If you have something that requires his attention, you can feel free to call me, and I'll try to direct you to whoever might have an answer for you. As well, start to set aside that time for that marriage seminar I talked about. You will definitely benefit from that. And, and one last thing, as we think towards next week and the message, in response to the message next week, we're going to celebrate communion again. And so as you're out shopping this week, please be mindful of that, that we're going to celebrate uh, communion. So get some bread, get some uh, grape juice so that you can be a part of that with us. Let's just close our time in prayer. Father, Once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your church. We thank you that you have knit us together. Father, help us to live like that as a case, united against any opposition, continually putting each other's first. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Have a good week.